Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic graph theory, although we are essentially doing matroid theory right now, which is kind of a generalization of algebraic graph theory. If you want, if you don't want to call the generalization, I will do it anyway, and we'll do it now or in this video. Um, and I would talk about, I'd like to talk about matrices because I do I need a reason to talk about matrices? Probably not. I just love matrices. So I will just talk about matrices. And at the same time, I talk about uh, matroids. Do I need a reason to talk about matroids? I don't. I really just like matroids. And it turns out that I can talk about both at once. Um, so I will tell you this, one of the main crucial questions in matroid theory. So matroids, absolutely fantastic, correspond to greedy algorithms and all that fun stuff, generalized linear algebra in some sense, and um, graph theory at the same time, and many other things. So yeah, so, and we would like to ask the following question. Is matroid theory actually a subset of linear algebra or is it really a generalization? Kind of a crucial question. And this goes under the slogan of representable matrix. And I will tell you some answers today and then I will continue uh, in another video. Okay, so linear algebra and the standard matroid we had is just take a matrix and then kind of the linear independent, the linear matroid. And the kind of matrix take the column vectors and kind of the linear independent column vectors should be a linear independent sets. That's a linear matrix. And every matrix gives rise to a matrix. And essentially the question I would like to address today is what about the converse? Does every matroid gives rise to a matrix? Or in other words, is every matroid actually linear? So this is kind of a tricky question because the matroid might arise some very, very different, like from a graph, and it's natural to write it down from a graph. But maybe there's some crazy cryptomorphism, some crazy isomorphism that turns it into a kind of a linear matroid. That's not that's not obvious at all. Why why shouldn't that be possible that you find some crazy matrix that describes the same combinatorics as your graph theoretical matroid or whatever type of matroid you're writing down? And that's uh, the set of representable matroids. So a matroid is called well, representable if it comes from a linear matroid. And that is really a problem. So let's go through, and it looks like it might be the case, huh? so that matroid theory is, is part of, kind of a subset of linear algebra, because if this would be true, that every matroid is representable, so somehow every matroid is representable in some form, in some obscure form, um, then one could would say matroid theory is actually a subset of linear algebra. And it looks quite, in fact, like it is, because kind of, the matroid object has a usual linear algebra theorem attached to it. And it really looks like it's what it is. A rank function is exactly doing the usual um, whatever they're doing in the linear algebra sense. So in what sense is this kind of taking a step back, gen seemingly generalize your, your the concept, in what sense is this actually more general than what you started with? And that's not quite obvious. Um, so usually, People do that all the time. They, they say I've generalized X, Y, Z, but they never really check whether they've done that or whether there's some obscure way to actually match it with the original definition. That could be a priori the case, and it would be really, really a problem for a uh, matroid theory because then fair enough people would say, uh, fair enough, sounds all good people would say, but this is actually just a subprogram of linear algebra. So why would I care, right? Hmm. So how to even attack that problem is really difficult and not quite clear. I'll show you some ways of doing it uh, next time. But a priori, you have some matroid and it clearly comes from forests or graphs or whatever, um, but there might be some crazy isomorphism that actually turns it into a linear matroid. How can you, how can you avoid that? Or how can you prove that this works? It's not, not obvious at all, but someone has said again, very crucial, because you want to make sure that the theory you are studying is not just a more complicated version of what you already studied before, right? Not the more general version, that would be okay. General and more general and more complicated, that's fine, but just more complicated. And that's uh, kind of a problem, right? Um, and yeah, so uh, remember that the greedy strategy always applies. So maybe the only greedy strategy algorithms are actually related to um, kind of, and matroids that, that are linear. So how can we do that? Combinatorial matroids can be represented in a non-trivial way. So this guy gives us some 
fun fancy greedy strategy. That's the Thanos plane. Um, and it's it's really just this picture, the, the matroid with seven points, and the bases are the sets of three points that are not connected in this picture. Always this confusing thing that they're not connected in the picture. And it turns out that this is actually representable. This is actually a linear matroid, and that's absolutely not obvious, um, but you need to use the field of characters for two. And you see another problem here, because you can saying that it's linear could be mean over very different fields. It could be linear over the complex numbers or, or a finite field with two elements or whatever. And it's really not obvious. So maybe what we are saying is that all greedy strategies, um, remember that I kind of identify matroids and greedy strategies, which is not quite true if you watch one of the other videos, but anyway, uh, that all greedy strategies are just part of linear algebra again. Um, and we said all of matroid theory, and that would be like very disappointing. And again, the problem here is that even something that is not obviously linear could still be linear. So how do you even do it? The final matroid arises from matrices. Right? And that's that's not obviously obvious at all. And yeah, the theorem today is they do exist. Uh, the smallest one is actually one that we have seen before. <laughs> this one here. So this already tells you something that it's not quite trivial to find them if the smallest one is on eight points. So the seven point, um, the seven point Feynman plane wasn't quite enough. You need you need eight points, and the problem is this whole strategy. I illustrated that here up here using kind of knots. This kind of famous uh, pair of knots that is called the Packle pair. Uh, that different knots, but people miss that for a long time uh, because they're kind of not distinguishable by essentially uh, the the most the standard. Um, uh, the standard knot invariants, and it's kind of really difficult. So people just missed that for years until uh, I think it was a lawyer called Paco just decided to build them out of rope and kind of prove that they are not the same. Um, you can't build matroids out of rope, so it's not as easy. Um, but there must be some way of doing this, and this is really not trivial how to do it. If the smallest one is already kind of on eight points, right? it's kind of, but it's a, such a crucial question. Uh, so we need to find some methods to do something here, right? It took really some time to find an example because simply proving that something does not work is actually quite difficult. If something works, you prove that, just writing down an algorithm or something, that still works. It's still difficult somehow, somehow, but kind of proving that something doesn't exist sometimes is really, really difficult. Um, so then there must be something we can do. So this is kind of the, the famous matrix that is not representable over any field. Um, and the proof, uh, the one you could try to write down, is assume otherwise, collect equations, and see that there's no equation, right? So they kind of assume that it comes from a from a uh, from a from a matrix. Write down the equation the matrix would have to satisfy, and see that there are no solutions over no fields. Um, that's that's fine. It at least gives us one example, but it's not a really good strategy. So we somehow need. Uh, better strategies, but I will talk about those uh, another time. So the whole point of this non-representability, you want many, many examples because you want to make sure that your matroid theory is not just a silly subset of linear algebra itself. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.